the law and you a look at laws in st vincent and the grenadines which affect our daily lives the law and the you law presented and by you. lawyer panel r campbell qc and brought to you on svg tv as a public service ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters boys and girls greetings welcome to another presentation in this public service nation building series the law and you this is program number 927 coming to you on Monday, the 25th of February, 2019. On this program, I will speak to you on the somber topic, Venezuela on the brink. But before getting into the program, a few preliminary comments. Firstly, and as usual, my condolences go out to all families which have suffered recent bereavements. And as I speak on this program, well, it is now afternoon, roughly quarter past three. But as I am doing the program, the funeral of the late Dr. Edgar Adams is supposed to be held at the Methodist Church. I would like to pay my respects to the memory of Dr. Adams, a national hero. I have known Dr. Adams since it must have been about 1961, when I was a member of Tim Daisy's group, St. Vincent Players. And he had recently come back from England. He had started a dance group. And I can tell you the best piece of dancing I have seen on stage in my life, live, was Edgar Adams performing the role, ironically enough, of the devil in a production of his dance group at Memorial Hall. He was just stunningly beautiful. Since then I have known him in, as a writer and in other capacities. And all of my children assuming they read the books, have been recipients of every title that Dr. Adams published in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We had an arrangement. I said to him, Doc, whenever you write a book, just bring about seven copies to my office. And he would do that, and I would ask him to autograph my copy and autograph copies for all of my children and they would duly present my children with his writings. He was a fountain of knowledge, a man of integrity, a man whom we would be difficult, it would be difficult for us to replace. A true nation builder Dr. Edgar Adams. In fact, I knew him professionally. There was a time when he outfitted me with my spectacles <laughs> at his spectacle shop because that was his profession, op optometrician. I sent my deepest condolences to the members of his family. I was also saddened to hear of the passing of another nation building Adams, this time Archdeacon Adams, who ministered as an Anglican cleric, mainly in Bequay. And during the time I was Attorney General, he was the main cleric for the Anglican Church in Bequay. Saddened I was to hear of the death of Mr. Norris Bullock of Calder, whom I met in England in 1979 when I went around with 
Carl Samuel and Alwyn Westfield to solicit supplies for the volcano relief efforts here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We went to various towns and cities in England and Mr. Bullock was among the main Vincentian stalwarts in England. Then in 2003-2004, when we had the constitutional review exercises, I led two delegations to England and he was one of the main persons who organized meetings for me and my delegation to discuss the constitutional proposals. He would be sadly missed by the Vincentian community. And just today on the death announcement, I heard of the death of Mrs. Luenda Atman of Georgetown. Luenda and her deceased husband were good friends of mine. In fact, they were clients of mine. Um, whom I got to know quite well, and I want to send out condolences to the whole family. I understand she'd be laid to rest on Saturday. And then, of course, my condolences very deeply felt to the family of the young man who was killed near the wrong boat at Fountain that tragic accident Sunday before last. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry that I was not available to present the live program last week, Monday. But I would let you know that there are days when I have problems with my voice and uh, I am unable to speak properly to make meaningful presentations. So whenever the voice is acting up, I, I just simply ask the technicians here at the studio to repeat a program. That is why I couldn't be live last week. But the week before that, I drew attention to the hearing of the election petition cases. Well, as everybody knows by now, the live hearings involving witnesses have been concluded. The lawyers have a deadline to make written submissions to the judge. They have another deadline to make oral presentations to the judge. And the judge has promised that he would render a decision sometime before the end of March. I followed the proceedings as best I could, on the, mainly on eyewitness news. And certainly quite a lot of material emerged from the evidence. It is up to the judge to make his decisions as to the impact which certain unorthodox or wrong procedures which were carried out by many of the election officials, the judge will have to make an impact on what a decision on what impact those errors would have had on the election, and he will rule accordingly. I ask you to suspend your judgment. Don't rush to conclusion. And as I promised, I will come and read you the decision if it be the will of the Lord, when it is rendered. Not the whole judgment, because I expect it to be very long, but at least 
the highlights and explain some parts to you. And I predicted, and I still stick to that prediction, that the losing side is going to appeal. So we have, we would not still have got to the very end of the matter at the end of this month, but we would be significantly nearer the end. Let us wait and see what will eventually emerge. Excuse me again. I am planning tentatively on next week's program to give you some of my personal views on several matters which are in local controversy between the political parties. In particular, I would want to give you my views on the proposed move from diplomatic support for Taiwan to diplomatic support for the People's Republic of China, as proposed by one political party. And I would also want to give you my views on the Citizenship by Investment program. So I hope you are ready and will be ready next week, Monday DV, to hear what I have to say on those topics for what it is worth. But for the time being, I want to look in a general sense at the situation in Venezuela. Because I seem to feel that Vincentians are not fully aware of the likely outcomes of the disturbances which have been going on in Venezuela. And in that context, I'd like to draw attention to an article on the subject written by my good friend, Mr. or I should say the Honorable Jomo Thomas, whose views on the subject are very close to my own. Now, sadly, the news reports over the weekend have indicated that there have already been some deaths in Venezuela taking place in the vicinity of the border with Colombia. Basically, in my view, what is happening in Venezuela is the result of, I would say, an almost unprecedented ignoring of the most fundamental principle of international law, namely that of non-interference in the internal affairs of states and the recognition of the sovereignty of states. International law is based on several principles. 
And one of those principles, in fact, the most cardinal principle of international law, is that one country should not interfere in the affairs of another country without good reason, without cause. Sadly, the government of the United States of America has paid no respect to that principle where Venezuela is concerned. Because I find it astonishing that a government could call for the overthrow of a duly elected government without there being demonstrated any prior interference from the subject government to the one calling for the overthrow. In other words, if it can be shown that Venezuela carried out any act of aggression or hostility towards the United States of America, then one might be able to build an argument that the Americans have the right to retaliate because one of the sovereign rights recognized by international law is the right of a government to defend itself from external aggression. But I have not heard of anything occurring in the recent past which amounted to an attack by Venezuela on the United States of America. Now, we who live in these parts know full well the attitude of the United States authorities over the years towards regimes in Latin America and South America which proclaim a different ideology. We, we know that. Similarly, those of us who live in this region know that in the past, there are some brutal dictatorships in the hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere, supported by the United States of America without regard to the hardships and cruelties inflicted by those dictatorships on their own people. But after the last presidential elections in Venezuela, which proclaimed that President Maduro had won the elections. I was not aware that, <clears throat> that there were any expressions of major dissatisfaction by countries. I didn't hear that the Americans had broken off diplomatic relations with Venezuela because of allegations surrounding the elections. And the aforesaid principle of international law requires governments to accept the declared results of elections held in those countries. In fact, international law allows a government to recognize a coup d'etat so that where a government is overthrown by armed forces in its own country, 
once the new persons or the new party or the, the army as it were, if it were the army, proves that it has become an effective control of the country. International law recognizes that countries are free to recognize the new government as they see fit. So that if a faction in one country overthrows its own government, it doesn't justify others from outside going in there and siding with one faction or the other. So that after the last elections in Venezuela, I thought, well, I know people quarrel and complain that this and that went wrong with the elections, but as far as I'm concerned, President Maduro was accepted as the legitimate president of Venezuela. And that principle of legitimacy appeared to be widespread internationally. Now, I know some people don't like the ideology of either President Maduro or the person he succeeded, namely President Chavez. But President Chavez happened to have been a friend of St. Vincent and the Grenadines on good ground. Venezuela was helpful to us, particularly in the building of our international airport. We accepted Venezuela as a sovereign country. And I assume that the rest of the world had done the same. But lo and behold, one morning I woke up and heard that the United States government had decided to recognize the so-called leader of the opposition in Venezuela as the new president. And then I heard that the new leader of the opposition, President Guido, had been proclaimed by elements of the state assembly as the new president of Guyana. Now, let me say this. <coughs> I do not regard any government as practicing sainthood. And to be honest, there were some policies of the Chavez government and then the Maduro government, which contributed towards the breakdown of normal economics in Guyana. Because ideology comes at a price. And the more radical the ideology, sometimes the more radical is the price which has to be paid. So I am not swearing for the bona fides of either the Chavez government or the Maduro government, but international law requires us to leave Venezuela to deal with its own internal problems.
I happen to have heard of some on the ground, on the ground, not on the ground, stories, tales from real life in Venezuela. Because I had a young cousin, a young lady from Barley, who got a scholarship to Venezuela and studied in Venezuela for a number of years. So from her, I got first-hand information as to some of the hardships which were being felt by the people of Venezuela. She since graduated and has gone on to be doing studies right now in Taiwan. So I was kept informed. And I knew that many people in Venezuela were feeling hardships. But I also know that under President Chavez, a lot of poverty had been erased in Venezuela. I happened to have traveled to Venezuela during the time I was Attorney General on two occasions and saw for myself the former shanty towns which had been transformed by President Chavez. Now, it is true that President Chavez ruffled American feathers by some of his policies. Many American corporations which functioned in Venezuela were not happy with what was going on and made their views known. But that happens throughout the world. But then the United States of America imposed a series of sanctions on Venezuela, which made the situation much worse, particularly for the poor. Some have pointed to the fact that because Venezuela sits on perhaps the largest oil reserve in the Western Hemisphere, that the desire to get control of Venezuelan oil explains a lot of what went on. But be that as it may, Venezuela's internal problems were for Venezuela to deal with. And therefore, to proclaim a different leader in Venezuela during the lifetime of the person who was elected leader is really to stage what can only be regarded as a coup. And we have seen, if we follow the news in the last few weeks, a gradual escalation in the tension because the United States has got most of the countries of Latin America to side with it in recognizing President Guido. The United States has used its might to mobilize the international community against President Maduro. The United States has called on the armed forces of Venezuela to rise up against their own president. And over the weekend, there was a standoff where shipments of relief supplies allegedly sent through both Colombia and Brazil, intended for 
Venezuela, which the Maduro government, having no choice, blocked. Because for the Maduro government to have allowed those shipments of aid to come in, as needed as they might have been, would have been to surrender and say, OK, well, I'm no longer in charge of, of, of this country. Take it over. So that I fear that we are in most likely for a lot of bloodshed in Venezuela. Already daily, thousands of people are streaming from Venezuela into neighboring countries, particularly into Colombia, Brazil. Some have gone into the parts of Guyana which traditionally Venezuela has claimed as part of their sovereign territory. You know, there was a song a few years ago, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Well, I fear that that song will have to be written, but this time the words have to be changed wrong. And they have to write a new song Cry plenty for me, Venezuela. Because there are yet scenes to be unfolded which are too dreadful for the imagination, but which unfortunately, to me, appear to be inevitable. For these reasons, I am 100% behind the government of St. Vincent the Grenadines in its principal stand in support of the government and people of Venezuela. Hopefully by next Monday, I will have a little update for you. But some, something makes me profoundly sad inside at what is yet to happen in Venezuela, having found itself caught up in international imperialism. That is all from this program of the law and you, program number 927. I look forward to being of further service to you next week, Monday, Davy, for another presentation in this public service nation building series, the law and you. Do have a pleasant week, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, and let us pray for the good people of Venezuela. May the good Lord continue to bless us all. The Law and You, a look at laws in St. Vincent and the Grenadines which affect our daily lives. The Law and You, presented by lawyer panel R. Campbell, QC, and brought to you on SVG TV as a public service.